For more, let's bring in Dr. Angela Rasmussen. She is a virologist at the Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security. Doctor, welcome. Great to have you with us. So picking up where Adriana just left off, FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn declined to give a specific timeline of how long approval of the vaccine developed by Pfizer would take but said he does hope there will be a decision by the regulator in December. Here's what he said when asked about the Trump administration's plans to inoculate 20 million Americans by the end of the month. Let's listen. So I think given what we know about supplies, it, it is realistic. It will very much depend upon the, the vaccination campaign and, and the final decisions of the CDC um, and Department of Health and Human Services about allocation. So, Doctor, what do you believe is the best and most efficient vaccination campaign going forward? Well, I think the best and most efficient vaccine uh, campaign going forward is one that can vaccinate as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Um, 20 million doses is really not that many when you consider um, the, the needs of all the people who are frontline healthcare workers who are going to be in those highest priority groups. It's certainly not enough to vaccinate all the people in those high priority groups by the end of the year. And actually, 20 million doses will only vaccinate 10 million people. So any plan uh, to carry out a vaccination campaign really needs to be a much longer term plan than just how many people can we vaccinate by the end of the year. We need to be focused on how to vaccinate the most number of people um, as quickly as possible, hopefully by next spring or early summer of 2021. Right. And yesterday we were also having a discussion about the fact that this is a dual dose campaign, uh, rather vaccination. And the campaign to get people vaccinated needs to include some information or some helpful, you know, guidelines on getting that second dose, because there are there is a lot of confusion and perhaps, you know, suspicion over two doses, which could make the situation worse if a lot of people end up only taking one dose. Correct. Absolutely. So we do know from even as far back as the phase one trials that these vaccine regimens are most going to be most effective. They're going to elicit the most robust immune responses if people do complete the two dose regimen. And I think another challenge that we need to be prepared for is the fact that these vaccines may be more reactogenic than most vaccines that people are used to getting, meaning that there will be side effects. Mm -hmm. um, they may be fairly unpleasant for a number of people. So we really need to start uh, reaching out now and communicating the importance of people not only getting the first shot, but completing the regimen in spite of the fact that there, there may be some uncomfortable side effects associated with it. Very good point. So you're saying for all those people out there who may be nervous about taking the vaccine, we need to get ahead of that and set the expectations to those people, making them understand they probably will have some side effects and that's perfectly normal, correct? Exactly. And this is one thing that I've been a bit frustrated with in terms of the way that the, the vaccine data has been released so far by essentially press release. It hasn't actually given us very much to go on in terms of what the safety and side effect profile is of these vaccines. So that makes it really difficult mm -hmm. to, to help people manage their expectations about what it's going to be like. Uh, and doctor, though, so far you're confident, I mean, of course, the FDA is going through its own approval process, but so far you're confident in what you've seen that this is a safe vaccine? I am, um, just in the sense that the, the trials themselves are overseen by a data safety monitoring board, which is an independent board. They will stop a trial if there's an unsafe uh, profile or if there are too many severe adverse events. So that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. These have proceeded. That suggests to me that they are safe. Um, the issue is really whether or not, you know, not so much that they're safe, it's whether or not they're actually comfortable for people to take. Um, and given the right. importance of taking the vaccine, we really want people to understand what that's going to be like. They need to be prepared. All right. So, doctor, we are seeing cities like Chicago, for instance, issuing stay at home advisories. And as we know, California is now imposing strict restrictions as well. So, I mean, I know no one wants to talk about it, but does this need to happen on a nationwide level, perhaps, until we can get the vaccine program up and running smoothly? To tell you the truth, I don't think it needs to happen until we can completely get the vaccine program up and running smoothly, because that will take months. But I think it would be helpful to have a national circuit breaker, in effect, um, to, to take a couple weeks of staying home. Um, to, to try to reduce transmission, which really is out of control nationwide. 
Um, now, whether or not that's actually going to happen, I don't know that it can without substantial government support at the federal level to make sure that businesses can remain operating uh, after uh, any stay home order ends, to make sure that people are able to pay their rent, to put food on the table, um, to, to keep their jobs. I think that without that extra support, it's really not feasible to ask people to stay home for any amount of time. And it's really, um, it's really unfortunate, and it's a huge failure, in my opinion, that this type of support hasn't been given to the American people to allow themselves to remain safe and to get community transmission down. Yes, and of course, that is on Congress. Uh, but in terms of what health care workers are focused on, how important are these next few weeks for the country? What's the biggest thing you'll be keeping a close eye on? Well, I'll be keeping a close eye on how many people are actually taking any measures to stay home uh, to, to reduce their risks, to wear masks, for example. There are some people who are, are basically completely unwilling to do any of the risk reduction measures. In communities where there's a lot of that, um, we're going to see cases continue to climb. We're already at the point, basically, where we're seeing one 9-11's worth of deaths every day. Um, I think that we are probably going to exceed 300,000 deaths, certainly by the end of the year. Um, that means that there's going to be a huge burden placed on the healthcare system. In communities where there's really, really high levels of transmission, we may start to see care rationing, which is already occurring in places. That might mean that people will die who don't have COVID, people who need care for other conditions, because the healthcare system is so overburdened, will not be able to receive that care. So it's a really, really grim situation that we're in. It's shocking to hear, uh, you know, you talking about care rationing, that that is something that we may be coming to and that, you know, doctors will be having to make those sorts of decisions. It's it's just so unfair to the doctors and to the hospitals and to those healthcare workers who want, of course, to help everyone. Well, Dr. Angela Rasmussen, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Tanya. Thank you.